I guess I'll start off with a question for everyone before I launch into a description of the project. Where do you come from? What do people know about their backgrounds? And because everybody has a sense of, you know, who their parents were, at least most of us do. And, you know, many of us know something about our grandparents and maybe even our great-grandparents. And ultimately, everybody hits a brick wall going back through the genealogical record. And you get to this point where you're in this dark and mysterious realm we call history. You can't say that much definitive about your ancestors. But it turns out that we're all carrying a historical document inside our bodies in the form of our DNA. Um, our genetic code, which you get from your parents and they got from their parents and so on, all the way back to the very beginnings of life. And so this document is what we use as a tool to study human history. Now, as you heard, I started off when I was a kid wanting to be a historian. I was fascinated by the idea of time travel. I went to see the King Tut exhibit that toured the States and God, I think it was 77 or 78. Um, stood in line in New Orleans in the rain for about 12 hours to get into the exhibit and was bowled over by it. It was so incredible. The, these amazing funerary masks and the chariots and all of these things that someone had actually used, but they'd used them 3,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago. It was almost like traveling back in time. And so I became obsessed with this idea of, well, what was life like back then? Clearly there were people around then, but all we know about them is what we can dig up out of the ground. We, we don't have this sense of direct connection the way I do to my grandparents and great-grandparents. It, it's, again, this, this realm of history. And so, you know, that was my passion for a long time. And then when I was around nine or ten years old, my mother went back to school to get her PhD in biology. And I discovered that science is about solving puzzles. It's not just about funny looking guys in white coats speaking a secret language and, you know, a lab behind closed doors. It's about solving mysteries on a daily basis. And by the time I got to college, or when I started thinking about college, I really wanted to combine those two. Um, this passion for history with this newfound love of science and solving mysteries, and really use science as a tool to study the past. And so what did I do? I decided to study genetics, as you do. Um, it, because genetics is really the historical branch of at least biological or life sciences. Because again, we get our, our genomes, our DNA, from our parents and grandparents. And so we're carrying a little piece of them inside our bodies. It's kind of cool if you think about it. You're, you're carrying around a piece of your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and so on, going further and further back. Now, the, the field of genetics was going through a revolution in the late 1980s and early 1990s when I was in graduate school. Um, the Human Genome Project was just getting off the ground and the technologies for analyzing DNA sequences were just really becoming available. So it was a really exciting time to be a geneticist and we were really starting to glimpse what the genome is all about. Now, the human genome is a very, very long piece of DNA. DNA is a linear molecule composed of four subunits. We call them A, C, G, and T. And it's the sequence of these subunits, um, repeated over a billion, over a billion times, um, that tell us basically how to make another version of you. It's, it's your blueprint, if you will. Now, we pass on, as I've already said, this, this genomic information or DNA information from generation to generation. But um, because it's so very long, occasionally when we're passing it through the generations, we will make a mistake. Um, it's like if you were given the job of copying War and Peace, a very long book by Tolstoy, over a thousand pages long. Word by word, you would occasionally make a, a spelling mistake. And our genome goes through the process of spelling mistakes as well. And we call these spelling mistakes mutations. Okay? This is the actual historical information in the genome. Because, of course, we look around the world and we're not all identical to each other. Most of the differences in physical appearance that we see are due to changes at the genetic level, and these changes originate as the, as the spelling mistakes. So what we as scientists do is we track these spelling mistakes in people all over the world. And if you share one of these mutations or genetic markers with someone else, it means you share an ancestor at some point in the past, the person in whom that change first occurred. And so it's by connecting up these genetic markers from people all over the planet that we can construct a family tree for everybody alive today. So that's, that's kind of the background on the science. Now, I, after graduate school, um, went to Stanford and studied with the founder of the field of human population genetics, um, Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza, and uh, really started getting involved in the, the sampling. Um, it, at that point, I had kind of gone beyond the, the theoretical framework 
for doing this kind of work and I've learned all the basics and it was really a question of getting the samples that we needed and the samples that we study as human population geneticists interested in history primarily come from what we call indigenous populations. Now what's an indigenous population? It's kind of difficult to define but basically they're people who've lived in the same place for a very long period of time and they have a sense of connection to their past, to the, the geographic region where they live um, that's greater than the rest of us. Those of us like myself, I live in Washington DC but my ancestors come from northern Europe. I wouldn't say that I'm indigenous to the eastern seaboard of the United States. But there are people, um, Native American tribes, for instance, who have lived in this area for a very long period of time, and they have stories that connect them with their ancestors, and they have a sense of connection to the place that I lack um, in my current location. So it, that was really the key by the 1990s. We had this amazing technology that would allow us to view these genetic markers, to see them and to study how they were related. But to make sense of the history contained in our genome, we really needed to study the patterns of these genetic markers in populations around the world. Because it's only by studying the distribution of the genetic lineages, the markers in different peoples from all over the planet, that we can reconstruct how we moved around the world. And so that's what my work over the last decade has really focused on. And I have worked in around 40 or 50 countries now. I've been to nearly all of the former Soviet republics. I've done a lot of work in Africa, in the Middle East, India, um, Siberia, and so on. And that work was kind of summarized in a book that I published in 2003 and in a film that came out that year um, as well called The Journey of Man. Um, and this was really focusing on the Y chromosome, which is a piece of DNA that only men have. You get it from your father, and he got it from his father, and so on. And it turns out to be a fantastic tool for tracing human migratory paths, for telling us how we moved around the planet. Um, what came out of that film was this amazing revelation that we are all effectively cousins, separated by at most a couple of thousand generations because we all share a common male ancestor, a single man who gave rise to all of the Y chromosome diversity in the world today, who lived in Africa around 60,000 years ago. It's an amazing story. We literally went from a small group of hunter-gatherers, and we now think that the number of people alive in Africa at that time, 60,000 years ago, that's only about 2,000 generations, 60,000 years ago was maybe only a couple of thousand people in one small population. We were on the verge of extinction as a species, and in the last 60,000 years, we've expanded to over 6.5 billion spread all over the world. We moved from Africa. Obviously, some people stayed on in Africa, but many left Africa, populated Asia, Europe, the Americas, um, and had this massive population increase, which has generated a tremendous amount of diversity. There are over 6,000 languages spoken in the world today, and many different physical appearances and different lifestyles, people who live in major cities, people who are still hunter-gatherers in you know, remote parts of the African wilderness, and so on. Um, it, it really is an amazing story. But the story that I told in Journey of Man was literally just a glimpse. It was a rough sketch of that incredible epic saga of our species. And as I was finishing it up, National Geographic, who were involved in the production of the film, sat down with me and they said, well, Spencer, we really like this kind of research. It's, it's fascinating stuff. We have a history of working with people who are studying human origins, the Leakeys, who did a lot of the work on, on the fossil finds in East Africa in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, we funded Jane Goodall, who's done a lot of that seminal work on the chimpanzee populations, um, perhaps giving us an insight into the behavior of early humans. Uh, we, we really think that the kind of work that you're doing, you and your colleagues um, as population geneticists, is going to revolutionize the study of human origins. And you know, we'd like to know what you want to do next which is a great question to be asked by National Geographic. And what came out of that was the Genographic Project, which we launched last year. And its stated goal is to effectively sample humanity's genetic diversity um, in an effort to answer that basic human question, where do we all come from? Uh, I said that the, the work we'd done for Journey of Man was a rough sketch because perhaps five or 10,000 people had been studied at that time for a handful of these genetic markers that connect people up in a family tree. But we really didn't have um, the very good sense of the details of the journey. I think it's quite clear that we came out of Africa and we moved from Africa into Asia and ultimately into Europe and into the Americas. But beyond that, 
We couldn't really say that much because we didn't have the detailed samples or detailed sampling that we need to be able to, to infer the details of our history. The, you know, the last 10,000 years in particular, where we've gone from being hunter-gatherers to living in these cities and you know, possessing technology that's allowing us to talk to each other over the internet today. Um, we don't know very much about that, and so we need to increase our sample size, uh, at least in order of magnitude, from these indigenous populations who carry the, the signposts that tell us how we've populated the world in their DNA. So that's the, the core focus of the project. We've set up regional centers all over the world. This isn't work that I can do alone. I can't literally sample 100,000 people myself. But I've got very dedicated colleagues, people I've worked with over the last decade or so. Um, North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, India, places like that. There are 10 of them. And they're charged with sampling roughly 10,000 people from the indigenous populations in their region. But this is a bigger project than that, and it's a bigger story that we're trying to tell because it's the story of all of us. So it's not just about us as scientists studying them, it's about getting the entire world involved in trying to tell the story of where we all came from. And so we wanted to make it as open as possible, as interactive as possible, to allow members of the general public, people who may know nothing about their ancestry, to find out a little bit more about it. So you can purchase a participation kit, you can get more information about the science that we use to study these things, and you can test your own DNA and see how you fit into this emerging global family tree. You can also choose to submit your results to our database. Um, and we very much hope that people who participate will choose to do that because as the database increases in size, our ability to say something about where we all came from increases as well. Um, so it is really kind of a new model for doing science. Um, you know, it's allowing the public to participate in a big scientific research effort. So often we, we hear about projects like the Human Genome Project or like sending a rover to Mars, and we might even be able to watch some of the stuff on the internet or you know, read articles about it in the newspaper as the results come out, but you can't actually participate. In this case, you can. You can actually be a part of this science, a part of the work that we're doing, which is really cool, I think. Moreover, by doing that, by purchasing one of these participation kits, the net proceeds from that, after we cover the cost of doing the genotyping and so on, this is the whole project is non-profit, but the net proceeds from the sale of those kits go back into the project. And the majority go towards something we call the Genographic Legacy Fund, which is a way to give something tangible back to the indigenous people who are forming the core of the sampling effort. And these people are, in many cases, the poorest of the poor in very poor parts of the world. I, I was just out in Chad. Um, in Central Africa, it's to the south of Libya, to the west of Sudan. If you've heard about Darfur in the news, that's happening along the Chadian-Sudanese border. I was out there last fall for about five weeks, and you know some of the people that we were working with out there, some of the indigenous communities, are literally destitute, and their way of life is in danger, um, in large part because they have to leave home in order to find work, in order to survive and feed their children. And when they do, they often enter this global melting pot that we're creating. We're all in the process of becoming ever more closely connected to each other genetically. We're becoming more like tiger woods every day, if you will. Um, and while this is probably a good thing socially, what it means is when people move into these melting pot communities, they lose touch with their traditional culture. Um, of the 6,000 languages that are spoken in the world today, between half and 90% are going to be extinct, no longer spoken by the end of the century. So we are going through a process of cultural mass extinction. And one of the things we want to do in this project is to raise awareness about that and possibly to do something to slow or even halt it in some cases. So we've set up this Genographic Legacy Fund, which at the moment has raised about $2 million to go back into these, these efforts to aid the indigenous peoples around the world. So that is a brief overview of the project. And at this point, I would love to open it up for questions, um, questions about me, how I got in, involved in this, um, although I've already covered some of that, questions about the project itself, about the science, about what you might find out if you do one of these cheek swap kits, um, anything. Um, but I'd love to hear from you guys.
Well, it's it's not only on the Y chromosome. The Y is what I focused on in my work out at Stanford and later at Oxford University and what that book and the film were based on. But there are other pieces of DNA we're looking at as well. So the Y is just passed down the male line, but there's a piece of DNA we call mitochondrial DNA that is passed down a purely female line. So everybody has mitochondrial DNA, but you only get it from your mother. Only women pass it on. And so we're looking at that as well to tell us about the female side of the story. Um, and eventually we're going to start looking at other parts of the genome as well. So not just focusing on these uniparental markers, as we call them, where you only get them from one parent, but focusing on the, the mass of DNA in your genome the 99% that's inherited from both parents to, again, fill in the details of the story. Okay, well, it is a very large and complex project, and, you know, luckily we have a very dedicated team at National Geographic and our partners at, at IBM who, you know, spend a lot of time making sure that these various components work well together. You know, it's, it's a big deal to set up these regional centers, make sure that they have all the equipment they need for the sampling and the genotyping, to collect all of that data into a, a central database so it can be analyzed, to make sure that the public participation kits are sent out on time, that the analysis is done properly, that we get it back on the website, and now to start to administer the Genographic Legacy Fund. So luckily we have a, a great team involved in all of that. In, in this huge enterprise, and it's you know a forty to fifty million dollar project over the next five years. So it's it's a non-trivial thing that we're trying to do. But in terms of the science, probably the biggest challenge is collecting samples and working with the indigenous communities, um, who often live in very remote locations, who often know next to nothing about modern science, and it, it's really a question of forging a bond of trust with them, explaining what it is we're hoping to do, to you know treat them as human beings, as collaborators in the effort to get them excited about being a part of it, in the same way that the, the people who buy the public participation kits are excited, and to collect the samples. It is you know. Uh, very difficult thing to do. I mentioned Chad earlier. You know that was a five-week expedition, but it took about eight or nine months of preparation time before we ever got out in the field. And that's being repeated at the regional centers all over the world. So that is really the biggest challenge of what we're doing. And that's that's the long-term scientific legacy of what the project is going to achieve: is assembling that collection of samples and the database of information that's come out, which is really a, a snapshot, a genetic snapshot of our species at this point in time before we lose all the diversity, before everything is so mixed up that we can't make sense of it. Um, you know, I, I, that's the reason why we're, we're mounting this project and that's the reason we're going to such great lengths to get out to some of these very remote populations. Very good question. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, the big thing that came out of the analysis that we had done on the Y chromosome and the, the story we told in Journey of Man was how closely related we all are. The idea that we're separated by no more than a couple of thousand generations is revolutionary. Um, if you had gone back, you know, even 20 years in time and studied physical anthropology in the 1980s, you would have learned, in most cases, that different human races were distinct entities that have been evolving separately for millions of years, perhaps. Um, this information really is turning all of that on its head, and it's forcing us to reconsider what it means to be a member of an ethnic group or a race. And what's very clear is that at the genetic level, races have no basis. Um, there are not these sharp distinctions between different people around the world. We're all part of an interconnected family, and we're interconnected through the migrations of our ancestors who have spread these genetic trails around the planet. Um, so, you know, you and I share genetic lineage is in common. We share an ancestor at some point um, in the last you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years. Um, it's an incredible story, and that's the story that really needs to get out. That's part of the reason why we go to such great lengths to communicate the results. We're not just publishing in the scientific literature. We are also trying to tell the story on the website, in documentary films, through the National Geographic magazine, books, and so on. Getting that story out is, is a vital part of, of doing this work because it does have resonance for people around the world. It does tell us something about how we should view each other as members of the family rather than as distinct entities, people you can discriminate against, perhaps. Um, you know, if you had asked me, as a scientist, do you think your work is going to have any social relevance? A couple of years ago, I might have said, I don't know. Um, realistically, nobody listens to scientists, at least the politicians don't, so, so who knows if it will or not. But 
Actually, we have gotten some very positive feedback. Um, a good example, I was in, in Lebanon recently doing a project with my collaborator there, um, Pierre Zalua at American University in Beirut, who's actually heading up our regional center in the Middle East and North Africa. And we had some preliminary results from the Lebanese population. And Lebanon is composed of Christian and Muslim groups primarily. And what the, the work showed was very clearly the Christian and Muslim population share genetic lineages. They are essentially part of the same population. There are not sharp distinctions between them. And this story was reported in the pages of National Geographic magazine a couple of years ago. And it was picked up on by one of the political leaders who repeated it on television several times, talking about creating a new sense of identity for the Lebanese people beyond Christian and Muslim, and that we should draw together because we share the same genes. I read it in National Geographic, he said. So maybe we can have an impact. I, I hope so. There have been some advocacy groups for indigenous people, primarily in North America, who have expressed some concerns about the project, um, why we're doing it, why we're focusing on indigenous peoples, and that you know this is a very important point. Um, you know, I completely understand their concerns because there is a history of colonial exploitation, particularly in North and South America. Um, so it's it's completely understandable that people would want to know more about the project. But by and large, when we get out into the indigenous communities, when we talk to them about the work we're doing and the excitement of being able to read this historical document and say more about their past than they may know about themselves, most people get really excited about that. So uniformly, the work that we have done with the indigenous people has been received very well. Well, OK, I, I'm a scientist. And uh, as a scientist, I like to keep my work, which is based on collecting data and testing hypotheses, separate from religion. Religion is about faith at its core. And you don't need to test hypotheses in order to believe in a religion or a religious doctrine. So I would like to see this work as being separate from a religious story a story of intelligent design or whatever it might be, the Tower of Babel and people being dispersed by God smiting the tower. Um, it is interesting, though, that the Judeo-Christian story of everyone around the world springing from a common source is consistent with what we're seeing scientifically. So maybe there was something to that story. Maybe they were anticipating the genetic results all those years ago. I don't know. But in general, I like to see the science as being separate from religion. Uh, I'm not sure what blood disease you, you would be talking about, but in general, we're, we're looking at genetic markers that have nothing to do with what we call a medical phenotype, so a disease or a clinical condition. We're just looking at things that will tell us about ancestry. Um, but, you know, there, there are diseases that will affect the, the pattern of mutations in different tissues. Um, they don't completely change your DNA. They don't turn you into a dog or something like that, but they, they can have a minor effect on the genetic composition of the cells. Um, for the most part, we, we don't study people who have any sort of disease. We're focusing on healthy individuals, and so we don't expect there to be any influence from the disease. Okay, thank That's a great question, and the short answer is we don't know. Uh, it's one of the things that we're hoping to focus on in the course of the project. How did we generate these patterns of physical diversity? Um, you know, for skin color, we have a reasonable hypothesis that since we evolved in Africa, and Africa is actually the most tropical continent on Earth, and because we don't have hair on the surface of our skin, we needed to have dark skin there in the tropics to protect our skin from the exposure to ultraviolet light. It turns out, though, that you have to allow a little bit of UV light through to the deeper layers of the skin in order to synthesize a vitamin D. If you don't, you have bone disorders. If you're a kid, you get rickets. If you're an adult, your bones break more easily. And so as we started to leave Africa and moved into northern climates, um, northern regions where we didn't get as much sunlight, we had to lose some of the pigmentation. So my skin, for instance, is, is lighter than a typical sub-Saharan African skin. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is, is something that Darwin called sexual selection and it has to do with how we choose our mates how we choose our husbands or wives or whatever um, and you have different preferences in different parts of the world some people think certain sets of characteristics are attractive in one part of the world and it, those may be very different in other parts of the world and over time those can produce changes in the way people look so that's probably the best theory going it, it was almost certainly a combination of the two adaptation to climate 
um, and this process of sexual selection over time that generated the diversity of appearances that we see around the world. So um, the answer is we don't know, but we are hoping to be able to find out at some point. Okay. What goals or goal do you have for this project and why? Well, the, the big goal is just to answer that basic human question, where do we all come from? Um, and, you know, we use DNA as a tool to do that because we can say something about our ancestry. Um, you know, beyond that, I would hope that people would, as I mentioned earlier, start to see themselves as members of an extended family, would treat each other with more respect. Um, and I hope that, you know, we'll be able to educate the public about genetics and about the science that we use to study these things. So it's, it's multifaceted, but at the core, you know, it's trying to answer that basic question about where we come from and how we generate the diversity. Have you, have you enjoyed going all over the world to study and research human evolution? Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I always loved travel as a kid. Uh, I didn't get to do as much of it as, as I wanted to. And, you know, I think that's part of the reason why, as I got older, I, I chose to go out on expeditions to wild and woolly places. And, you know, it, it, experiencing the different cultures around the world, the different ways of life, the different geographic regions from high mountains to the desert and, you know, people living on the coasts of South Africa, I, it, it is utterly fascinating. And, you know, I've got the greatest job in the world, i got to say. You know, whenever a large scientific project gets off the ground, there are people who ask about the methods, and the nature of the scientific process is that there is always a debate going on, a dialectic as we call it, and people will provide evidence on either side, and you evaluate the evidence, and at the end you decide one way or the other on a hypothesis or about the methods you're using. So of course there have been questions raised about what we're doing and why we're doing it, but I think by and large we've been able to answer them, and, and the scientific community is, is very supportive. That just came out of the analysis. It, it, there was no bias that went into that. We were literally just studying people from around the world and asking a really kind of basic, stupid question, if you will. What does that family tree look like and where is it rooted? Where are the deepest lineages in the family tree? Which means that, you know, when we talk about the depth of the tree and the root and so on, we're looking at the number of these mutational events that have occurred over time. So the deeper the lineage, the longer those lineages have been around. The, the longer they've been accumulating these mutational spelling mistakes that I mentioned earlier. And so those deepest splits in the family tree are found within Africa. And that tells us that we originated in Africa, and at some point a small group left Africa to populate the rest of the world. But it's something that came out of the analysis, just collecting samples from people in South America, North America, Africa, Asia, Europe, all over the world and saying, how do they all fit together into this tree? Boom, the deepest split is found within Africa. That means we came out of Africa. Yeah, Lucy is a very well-known discovery found by Don Johansson in the 1970s. Um, and she was named for a Beatles song that was playing in the camp that night, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, um, which was a very popular song at the time. Um, she is a member of a genus known as Australopithecus. Um, I think she's afarensis, the, the species. But um, that is a potential human ancestor, a distant ancestor millions of years ago. But she's not necessarily directly related to us because we now know from all this amazing work that's gone on by Don Johansson and the Leakeys and others in the East and in South Africa that there were a huge number of different hominid species around two, three, four million years ago. In fact, there, there was even a recent discovery in Chad uh, dating back to nearly seven million years ago. So there's this, this very bushy potential history um, going far enough back in time. And we don't know at the moment exactly how we're related to all of these individuals. Is Lucy our direct ancestor? Um, what about Homo erectus, um, Homo heidelbergensis, all of these other various species? Um, what we're really focused on in our work is much more recent history. So it's really about the last 200,000 years or so. Things that we would call Homo sapiens, our species. Um, and beyond that, we can't really say that much using genetic technology about our relationship to individuals like Lucy. But paleoanthropology is a fascinating field, and it presents us with a multitude of possibilities about the way our ancestors could have lived.
Well, there's still lots of people living in Africa, about 800 million of them, and their ancestors stayed on there. Uh, they've lived in Africa since time immemorial, you know, since before Homo sapiens even originated as a species. So, you know, there are people who stayed on there, but in terms of the last wave of migration, significant wave out, it was really around 45,000 years ago moving up into the Middle East. And that was the main wave that, that migrated into Asia and into Europe and into the Americas. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen with us. Typically that happens when the population size gets very, very small. It drops down to a few individuals perhaps. And there have been cases where that's happened with human populations. There's an island in the Atlantic called Tristan de Cunha, which was settled by a few sailors a couple of hundred years ago. And there's a high frequency of genetic disorders, diseases in that population as a result of this inbreeding. You know, we've got six and a half billion people. What's happening is we are all mixing to a much greater extent. We're becoming more heterozygous, if you will. We're, we're generating new patterns of diversity. We're not getting rid of the old ones. We're, we're generating new patterns. And, you know, in terms of predictions, I don't think that it's going to have a detrimental effect on us, medically speaking. It's just that we're losing that context that I talked about before, the genetic patterns of the indigenous people that take us back in time and allow us a glimpse of what our ancestors' genetic patterns would have looked like. So so I, I don't think it's going to have a detrimental effect medically, it just makes my job really difficult. Uh, I don't know if I would be arrogant enough to say that, but I, I would hope again that people would take on board some of the, the social implications of this, this work, that it's not simply a scientific project, it's, it's more about the history of all of us and how interconnected we are. So, in that sense, I would hope that it would have an impact. Um, I am off to Polynesia this summer, to the Marquesas Islands, um, which are located about 2,500 miles southeast of Hawaii, um, some of the most remote islands in the world. Um, and this fall, I'm going to be in Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and China on another expedition. No, that's not the goal of what we're doing. Now, medical genetic research is tremendously important, and there are lots of efforts going on all over the world, but by companies and government-funded entities, tens of billions of dollars being spent on that, and it's, it's very important. What we're doing, though, is just focusing on markers that tell us about our ancestry. It's, it's really just a historical and anthropological project. Again, because we have this closing window of opportunity in which to do this work before the people who give us the signposts, the indigenous people, have all moved and mixed and lost their connection with the past. So, no, we're, we're not doing anything which is going to have known medical relevance. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are a couple of things. Um, one is discovering that science is fun. I had some fantastic high school science teachers, particularly a, a, bi a biology teacher named Charles Swift, um, who was my ninth grade science teacher, and you know he just made the whole field so exciting and so much fun that I really wanted to pursue it. It was also having positive role models like my mother and learning that science can be something that you can spend your life focusing on. It's not just something you learn in school that has no relevance to the rest of your life. It's, it's potentially something that's quite important. Science plays such a huge role in everyday life that, you know, we almost kind of forget how important it is to make these basic research advances. But, you know, everything in, in your world today is based on scientific discoveries over the last couple of hundred years. The cell phone you use, the equipment we're using to talk to each other right now, the work I do, um, you know, using science in new ways is, is very, very exciting. And it's great to have positive role models, people who are doing this, um, so the kids can see that, you know, it, it really can be a career choice. Uh, I get a lot less sleep these days. <laughs> no, it's um, 
really, it's the opportunity to travel around the world and meet so many different kinds of people and to be able to spread this message that we're, we're very interconnected to each other and to you know, tell people about the technology we're using and the information we're getting back from the scientific studies. Uh, it is uh, a tremendous thing to be able to do for a living. And like I said, I think I have the greatest job in the world. So if anything, you know, it's changed me in a positive way, I would hope. No, I, I would really like to see this as an opportunity to make a seamless transition from what we know about our genealogy, what we know about the last couple of generations, all the way back to the very beginnings of our species, and to be able to trace these lineages throughout the, those time scales. So we're not just limited to looking at things that happened 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. We can also look at the effect of um, you know, the, the spread of empires. We think we've identified in a study that came out a couple of years ago, Genghis Khan's Y chromosome from the genetic impact of, of his expansion in the, the 13th century. So, um, you know, I, I would like to be able to, to apply this to very recent events in human history as well. We have the goal of sampling 100,000 people from indigenous communities during the lifetime of the study. But beyond that, we also have the public participants. And at the moment, we have sold over 140,000 participation kits. So you know, the numbers are enormous there. We think that ultimately, we will have the largest genetic database in the world, or certainly one of the largest in the world, with hundreds of thousands of people in it. Yeah, well, that's that's really the fun and the ultimate challenge of doing this kind of work. I mean, what we can say as geneticists is kind of the who, the where, and the when of how people are related to each other. But the how and the why is a big part of the story. And to fill that in, we have to move beyond the field of genetics and look at the field of paleoclimatology, the study of past climates, paleoanthropology, these you know human remains that have been left over the last few million years. Um, archaeology and linguistics is incredibly important. Trying to piece them together to fill in the, the details of, again, how and why we would have moved at a certain time. We see a genetic pattern and we want an explanation for it. So climate, as you mentioned, is, is very important in determining the early migrations of our species because we were still living as hunter-gatherers then, and hunter-gatherers in many ways are incredibly dependent, more dependent than we are, on the local climate. And when the climate changes, if you are used to living in a grassland, it suddenly becomes a desert you're going to be forced to move because the game that you live off of have moved as well. So climate played a huge role in the early days of our species. It's what nearly drove us to extinction 60, 70,000 years ago. And it is also probably what allowed certain migratory routes to open up. Um, the sea levels dropped during the last ice age and it made it very easy for us to start to leave Africa along a southern coastal route and to get to Australia quite quickly. It also allowed people to make it across the Bering Land Bridge between Asia and the Americas around 15,000 years ago. So yeah, climate has been important, but again, to make sense of the genetic patterns, we have to take into account all of these other fields, it, it, which is part of what makes my job so interesting and difficult is you have to keep up with all of these different areas. No, I don't think that has anything to do with it. Uh, you know, the, the poverty in Africa is really something that has only come about in the last couple of thousand years. There's a very good book that I'll recommend to you guys written by someone named Jared Diamond um, called Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is all about the history of the last few thousand years, trying to answer that question, why are some geographic regions so rich and influential and others so poor and relatively non-influential? And the main argument that he makes, and I think it's a very good one, comes down to geography, um, and it has to do with the number of species that can be domesticated, it has to do with the ability to transmit ideas from east to west rather than north to south where you're changing the climate quite a bit and the, the way people live. Um, I would just recommend that you read that, but as far as we can tell, it doesn't have anything to do with humans having originated in Africa, because at various points in the past there were incredibly wealthy African empires um, with incredibly complex societies, and you know some of the oldest universities in the world, much older than any of the universities universities in Europe um, are found in Africa, um, Timbuktu for instance. So you know, at various points in the past, Africa has been very advanced. It's just that at the moment, for various reasons, it's not as advanced economically as, say, Europe and, and North America. Okay. 
Well, this is a five-year effort. Uh, if we could sample every person alive today, we could absolutely put everything to rest, but that's impossible. Um, you know, we couldn't literally do it logistically, and it would be far too expensive. So we're trying to take as large a sample as we can, and the, the goal is to wrap up the project by 2010 and to have released the information out into the public and allow the database to, to be mined by other scientists to go in and do other analyses on it um, and to tell the stories that have come out of it. Um, in terms of how you recognize the indigenous peoples and how you make contact with them, this is why this project has to be done in the way it's being done. We have networks of collaborators, anthropologists, um, you know, historians, certainly geneticists who've been working with communities around the world for a very long time. And you know, we're trying to integrate all of this information and this, this network into the project. And so it's primarily through connections. Um, you know, when, when we were planning the Chad trip, we talked to dozens of people in, in the country and outside of the country about the possibility of going there to work with the people, and we sent lots of information to them about the goals of the project and why we were interested in certain population groups, and we wanted to hear back from them, you know, what are the reasons you might want to participate, what are the questions you might want answered. So, it, you know, it is quite difficult, and I, I alluded to that earlier, that's, you know, the biggest challenge in this project is, is the outreach to the indigenous communities. It's it's not an easy thing to do, but you know it's critical to make the project work. In terms of the Americas, the evidence is that, at least the genetic evidence, and a, a careful analysis of the archaeological record tends to agree with this, that humans did not enter the Americas, um, and they entered North America first, until really the last 15 to 16,000 years. And it was via Siberia, via the Bering Land Bridge. And once they got past the ice that was covering most of Canada at that time, uh, possibly through an ice-free corridor down along the Rocky Mountains, they basically exploded. The population, you know, there was there was no real competition, no other hominids living there. There were, you know, vast grasslands with game and so on. And they literally migrated from the Canadian ice sheets down to Tierra del Fuego, the tip of South America, within a few hundred years, as far as we can tell. It was an extraordinary kind of blitz through the continent. And in the process, a lot of species went extinct. Um, there were horses in the Americas before the Spanish brought them over, um, but they were driven to extinction by, we believe, these early human populations because they were such a great food resource. So, yeah, literally, you know, within a thousand years, within a few hundred years, they migrated from North America all the way down to South America. And then we think there was a later migration, probably along the coast, in boats, that came down and only made it to, to Western North America. And these were people who actually spoke a different set of languages, the, the Nadine languages. Um, you know, that probably happened around six to eight thousand years ago, as far as we can tell from the genetic data. But, uh, yeah, the story of how people conquered the Americas and literally it seems to have been a, a conquest within a thousand years going from Siberia all the way down to the tip of South America. It's an amazing story.